happen to you? It seems to be happening with increasing regularity. Hundreds of apparently sane and sober people have turned up at police stations all over Britain reporting sightings of big cats. Of course, it could just be vivid imagination of the Loch Ness Monster variety. But all of these constant reports are intriguing and convincing. Perhaps these creatures do exist in the British countryside. But if they are out there, what are they? Definitely not a dog. I've never seen anything like it before. From time to time, it's still um, killing sheep and lambs around this area. He heard what we assume is the beast scream or screech, as he put it. And in fact, he ran a mile. It frightened him, literally ran a mile. It frightened him so much that he was a mile away from where he was originally before he realized what he was doing. There's at least six farmers in, within the immediate area have all seen it in the last three years. And they all say it. It is not a dog. It's definitely cats. The story starts here in the Surrey Stockbroker Belt. It's not exactly the sort of country you'd expect to provide cover for an exotic wild animal. But then Surrey is full of surprises. We're only 30 miles from the centre of London, but we could be in another world. And in fact, it was in these very woods that a ferocious creature made its home. The first person to notice it was a man picking blackberries who was confronted by a cat-like creature which spat at him. Then a cow was clawed and bitten. Two goats were killed and another was badly maimed. And then a cat-like creature was seen eating a deer on a bridle road. By now, the police were worried and decided to call in an expert. Victor Manton, director of Whipsnade Zoo, arrived. I had been down at Godalming Police Station that morning when a report came in that a forester had heard a deer screech at the edge of some water where obviously it had been drinking. We rushed out from the police station and we found on the edge of the water a carcass. Now, being a veterinary surgeon, I was able to post mortem it. We noticed that the joint between this vertebra and that vertebra was dislocated. Now, how does that happen, you might ask yourself. It seemed to me that the vertebra had to snap like that. Now, it wouldn't snap under the weight of the animal's body. It must have snapped because it had a heavy blow from another animal or because another creature jumped on it from behind. And by carefully examining the hind quarters, there were some large scratch marks uh, which indicated to me that something like a large cat had in fact jumped on this deer from behind as it was drinking and the combined weights of their bodies had gone forward and broken the animal's neck. But couldn't a fierce dog have done that? A very fierce dog would hardly have left those scratch marks on the hind quarters. A very fierce dog, I doubt, would have jumped in that way. After all, as you can see around here, there isn't all that much cover. Perhaps this animal leapt from a tree. So from all the evidence, what's your final conclusion? What I'm saying is there was definitely something strange in this area. And the most likely animal which could have uh, fulfilled all the descriptions that we heard was a puma. The puma. It's one of the most spectacular of all big cats, around eight feet long from nose to tail and weighing up to 250 pounds. And because they can live in the American Rocky Mountains, where winter conditions are extremely harsh, one could easily survive our comparatively mild climate. But how could a puma have found its way to the Surrey countryside in the first place? At that time, there were pet shops all over the country which advertised that they could get you any animal you wanted. There were no restrictions on importing many of these animals and none on keeping them. Could a puma really hide away in Surrey? There are some very thick areas where an animal could lie hidden for weeks, there are roe deer, rabbits abounding. Yes, a cat could certainly live in this area for the whole of its life. We can be almost certain there was an escaped puma roaming the Surrey countryside for several years. But there have been no sightings for some time now. The trail has gone cold, so police have closed their files. But there's certainly still a lot of police activity here, in North Devon, home of the Beast of Exmoor. A beast which keeps hitting the headlines as it terrorises local people and regularly slaughters their sheep, outwitting local farmers and police night after night. 
Well, in February 1983, Mr. Lay from Drewstone Farm came to us concerned because he'd lost 10 lambs. And at the time, both us and him thought it was a dog that was doing it. So we explained to him the law with regard to him shooting dogs that were worrying his sheep. After about another fortnight, he came back to us again to say that, in fact, he'd then lost about 30. So we realized then it was perhaps something more than a dog. But weren't people living in this area just getting a bit carried away? But a lot of the eyewitnesses who have actually seen this beast are good, true, North Devon country people who've lived in the country all their lives. And, um, I mean, they're certain that this is not a dog. It is a possibility that it could be some wild animal which someone has set loose because of the, the Wild Animals Act, which came into force in 1969, um, whereby people have, a li have to have a license. And there's massive regulations with concerning the cages and so on that they've got to have. Is it possible that the beast responsible for killing over 50 sheep on this farm alone is also a puma? It could well be. According to some people, who suspect the man who used to run this shop a few years ago as a butcher's. He had a most effective burglar deterrent, a puma, used to prowl around in here after closing time. The district council told him he had to get rid of it, but since then there's been a lot of speculation over its whereabouts. We thought it was dogs or foxes killing lambs at first, when we saw it at first. And then as time went on, everyone kept their dogs all shut in. And we started looking further and thought it was foxes. And then we decided it wasn't foxes, it was something else. And we spent, stayed up night times looking for these animals. And we, we did hear um, queer noises of screeching noises at different times during the night. And they keep, they keep coming regular and keep killing these sheep and they, they killed them in an unusual way. They caught them by the top of the head or the neck. Some of the lambs, their skull cap was pulled right off in their ears and they used to eat the head and the neck right down to the shoulder and sometimes all of a lamb. The way it was killed and the way it was at was much different than the way it's done with dogs because if dogs worry sheep and chase them, they usually pull the wool out and you usually get a lot of wool lied around the fields where they've been chasing the sheep. But on this occasion, these occasions, the lambs were caught uh, very cleanly and killed and they were wrapped cleanly right out. There was no wool whatsoever littered around the carcass. Perhaps a puma, but when I met people who'd recently seen the beast, the mystery deepened. Well, I was riding on the common, looking at my sheep, when looking towards where there was a bit of a bog and it was very hot weather, I saw two ears sticking up amongst the um, reeds, rushes. And um, I thought, oh, funny, that's not, you know, a sheep wouldn't be down there. I turned the horse's head towards it and this animal sort of, suddenly sort of showed itself more. And I described the look of where it sort of sat, like a cheetah. You know, I, I've seen sort of pictures on, on the films, you know, where it's a bit of a slant, I don't know if that's correct. And suddenly, as I sort of rode the horse a little nearer, it jumped up, you see, and it um, bounded away. And I thought to myself, that's not a dog. You know, I thought that's a cat of some description, a great big cat. Well, the nearest I've been to it is about 100 yards, and it is slightly bigger than an Alsatian dog in the region of 140, 150 pounds. It, it got a very low slung body, very deep body. It's got a massive tail that comes down and flows straight out. Its tail is long as its body. The neck and the shoulder come straight down with a little round head on the end of it. It doesn't come up like a dog or anything like that. And its head moves up and down as it goes along, and I think that is because its back legs seem to be higher than its front. About the height of a big black Labrador. I mean, I thought at first a dog, then I saw it certainly wasn't a dog. Uh, I could see about its round face and a couple of little pointed ears, you know, sticking out like a cat's ears, and a flat face. There was no snout like that we would associate with a dog. And I could tell at once it wasn't a dog. To me, it was a large black cat-like animal. It had a most beautiful glossy coat that I've ever seen any animal have, absolutely shone. It had a thick tail, the beginning of its tail was thick, but I couldn't see the rest of it because the rushes were fairly sort of high. And it bounded away and within seconds it had disappeared. But as I was on a horse, I thought well, I could see it perhaps 
going up over some fields that were near or down through the sort of coombe, but I didn't see it at all. So, uh, sort of th thinking about it since, I wondered whether it just sort of lay low, you know, till I'd gone again. Certainly no dog. And although some of its features are puma-like, others aren't. Colour, for example. Dominant black, but there is a sort of a smoky rust in it. It was jet black. What colour? Black. So the butcher's puma was a false lead, and there are two reasons why we can be certain of that. One is that all the people who've seen the beast of Exmoor are sure that it's black, and pumas, including the butcher's puma, are brown. And the second reason is that although people were suspicious that the butcher's puma was roaming around this area, we've recently managed to track down the vet who destroyed that animal. And there was always another problem with the lone puma theory. Several people have seen two of the big cats together, so were they breeding? It may sound far-fetched, but there are already plenty of foreign animals breeding in the wild in Britain. The mink, for example, which originally escaped from fur farms in the 20s. Then there's the wallaby, a really bizarre animal to find in the northern hemisphere. It's another exotic SKP, which has been living and breeding wild in several colonies in the north of England for almost half a century. From South America, we got the koipu. Even though tens of thousands have been killed, they're still breeding and keeping their heads above water in East Anglia. The shy, dog-sized muntjac deer originally came from China, but now live and breed successfully throughout southern England. If there is a big cat breeding on Exmoor, what could it be? Might it be a lynx? Well, the lynx does fit the descriptions of some big cats seen in Britain, but not the black cat of Exmoor. In fact, none of the big cats are normally black. Some of them do, however, occasionally throw up black mutants, like the black leopard, often called a panther. So we prepared black silhouettes of various big cats to see if they jogged a memory. A black leopard. Definitely not the last one. No, there's one more. A cheetah? No. The puma? No. A jaguar, perhaps? No, nothing at all. That's the description. The ears there are similar to the thing I saw. Sharp, pointed ears. No, I didn't see anything like that. Again, no. I None of them no quite matched no. what eyewitnesses had seen. So, until something is caught, it's impossible to reach a verdict on the beast of Exmoor. It's probably a large, exotic cat, and it's certainly still here. The trail of the big cat next took me north, to the highlands of Scotland, and perhaps the strangest cat of them all. These vast and isolated tracts of Scottish forests and moorland looked like perfect big cat country, and so they proved to be. Because recently, Scottish evidence has provided a completely new twist to the big cat detective story. To begin with, the reports were very similar. Frightening confrontations. Sightings of something big, black and vicious. But then, concrete evidence at last. A body. Now, a body in Exmoor or Surrey would have answered all the questions and wrapped up the case. After all, a puma is a puma, an easy animal to identify. But in this case, instead of answering all the questions, the Scottish big cat just posed a lot more. Because this is no escaped exotic. And in fact, no scientist has ever seen anything quite like this before. And it wasn't just one body, others started to turn up too. Some people said they must be feral cats, domestic cats gone wild, but they were far too large. And they weren't Scottish wild cats, which are large, 
but they're always tabby. The black cat is actually, um, to see him, it's a very, very impressive animal because of, of the pure blackness of his coat. If you see him going across the field, we actually saw one coming across the field here about two weeks ago, and um, very, very impressive sight. He moves very, very gracefully. Doesn't, a domestic cat will sneak along, whereas a wild cat moves very, very gracefully. He, he, he bounds like a, like a big cat. Everybody has their own idea what it is, and I think the time has come that somebody must definitely say yes or no as to what it is. To try to sort out the confusion, a body was sent to the Natural History Museum in London, where disbelieving scientists could investigate. So, will the verdict be reached down here in the vaults of the museum? Will the experts be able to match up the Scottish big cat with any other sort of cat? Well, the big cat does look all that big when you compare it to something like the puma. But from the single specimen they have, it's definitely bigger than a domestic cat. And it's also bigger than the average size Scottish wild cat, although these do get larger than this. And from people who've seen a number of these, they say the black cats can be surprisingly big, especially the males. But size is unreliable. Much better are the subtle clues in the skulls. And we've got a whole range of cat skulls here, from the puma and lynx, the Scottish wild cat, domestic cat down here at this end, and in the middle, the black cat. As you can see, in size, quite similar. To find out more, you have to look closer. In a true Scottish wildcat, the bones around the eye are quite far apart, while in the domestic cat, they're much closer together. And in the black cat, they're close together, a domestic cat feature. So perhaps the people who say they're nothing but overgrown moggies are right. After all, they are jet black, and wild cats aren't black. But does the skull tell us anything more? In a wild cat, the bone across the top of the nose is almost straight, while in the domestic cat, there are two distinct notches. With the black cat, they're straight across, a wild cat feature. The jaw bones are different too. A wild cat's jaw stands up on its own. A domestic cat's jaw always falls over. And the black cat's stands up, another wild cat characteristic. Even after almost 50 features of the cat's anatomy were analyzed, the picture is still very confusing. The black cat keeps throwing out conflicting clues. For example, on one hand, from its colour and certain skull features, it appears to be like a domestic cat. But there are many other features which make it close to the Scottish wild cat. Yet overall, it seems to look different to either of them. Could it be some sort of a cross, a hybrid? Well, that's extremely unlikely. The Scottish wild cat is a different species from the domestic cat, so it's a bit like a lion and a tiger crossbreeding. And in the wild, that sort of thing just shouldn't happen. Whatever the answer is, these black cat bones had told us all they could. To try to finally solve the mystery, there was only one option left. We had to go back up to Scotland and do what had never been done before. Bring in a big cat alive. If we could catch a live cat, it would give us a chance to get a fresh blood sample and that could be used to analyse the genetic makeup of the cat, which should tell us the truth about its ancestry. Scientists had already tried to do this with blood taken from dead black cats, but it had always failed because the cells in the blood start to break down almost as soon as the animals die. All we had to go on in setting the traps were eyewitness reports from local people of where the black cats had been. We chose areas where there were also cat droppings and cleaned out rabbit skins, all the cats leave behind of their prey. Once the traps were in place, it was just a matter of waiting and hoping. For six weeks, the traps remained empty. But then, one morning, we got one.
It was a female, so it was smaller than the males, but unmistakably one of the jet black Scottish big cats. She was transferred to a protective travelling box to be taken to the Highland Wildlife Park, where there are experts at handling wild cats. They could help us take that all-important blood sample from what it was becoming increasingly obvious was a very wild animal. A cat which couldn't settle in captivity. In the cage next door was a true Scottish wild cat, so their behaviour could be compared. Over the years we've had quite a few wild cats and perhaps feral cats brought in here and it takes them a while to settle down. Now we've had her almost two weeks and usually the wild cats are settling down by then, but the, the feral cats will probably be much quicker to become quieter. So she seems to be a mixture of things, doesn't she? Certainly very much so. Um, she's an extremely beautiful cat. Let me see that for her. Beautiful fiery eyes. Now at last, while the vet was giving her a careful checkup, we had the unique chance to get a blood sample from a living black cat. She was lightly anaesthetised, so that a small syringe of blood could be taken. At the same time, while one of the park's wild cats was in for its cat flu jab, we got a blood sample from that animal too. By comparing the blood from these different species, we hope to discover the black cat's ancestry from clues locked up in the cells. Then those blood samples and samples from a domestic cat were rushed to the genetics department at Aberdeen University before they could deteriorate. Scientists were preparing a special concoction of chemicals in an attempt to keep the blood cells alive. They were after the chromosomes, which are in the white blood cells. But unfortunately for most of the time, chromosomes are completely invisible. You can only see them when the cells are about to divide. So the first stage was to prepare a culture medium, which was to be used to encourage the blood cells to grow and divide. When that culture medium was ready, the precious blood, which contained the secret of the black cat, was added drop by drop. The mixture was then incubated for three days at body temperature in the hope that the cells would start to grow. And they did grow, so a chemical was added to freeze them just when they were dividing and their chromosomes were easiest to see. To isolate the important white blood cells, the blood was spun down in a centrifuge. The culture medium was sucked off and finally the red blood cells were removed leaving behind the white blood cells in solution, the cells which should tell us what we want to know. The scientists were nearing the end of their detective work. All that remained to be done was to stain the white cells to make the chromosomes visible. So now, for the first time ever, the black cat's genetic makeup was on display. Normally the chromosomes are all jumbled up like this, but to make life easier, they can be cut out and arranged neatly into groups. We inherit, all of us, one chromosome of a particular kind from our fathers and one from our mothers, and cats are no different, of course. So it's not surprising that each type of chromosome occurs as two copies in the cell. And of course, if we find a difference in genetic structure between those two chromosomes, that indicates that there was a difference between those particular chromosomes in our parents. First, we didn't find any differences, but then we used different techniques and we did find some differences. For example, in chromosome E1, if we look at the domestic cat, we find that at one end of the chromosome, there is a large spherical structure and both chromosomes of type E1 in the domestic cat have the same size of structure. But if we look at the chromosome E1 in the wild cat, we find that these structures are rather small. When we look at the black cat, we find that one chromosome E1 
has a large structure, but the other chromosome E1 has a small structure like the wildcat. And there were differences in other chromosome pairs too. Because you've shown the parents are genetically different, does this mean the black cat is a hybrid? Yes, it certainly suggests that the domestic cat and the wild cat have contributed to the ancestry of this black cat. The truth about the black cat has been established. It is a hybrid. But different species shouldn't mate in the wild. So how were the normal scientific rules broken to produce this beautiful animal? The most convincing theory takes us back to the First World War. During the war, huge numbers of Scotsmen left their country never to return. Many of the soldiers emigrated after the armistice. Now, before the war, the Scottish wildcat had become almost extinct, driven back by man into the highlands. But because many gamekeepers and farmers didn't return, wildcats started to spread again, and it was probably then that a nomadic male wildcat, losing contact with its own species, mated with a domestic cat, founding the new black cat line. Unlike Surrey or Exmoor, the Scottish big cat is homegrown. But it's joined a select band of remarkable cats living wild in the British Isles. So it isn't imagination. There are big cats living in Britain and possibly breeding too. Both the Scottish black cats and all the escaped exotics. And the reason that these creatures managed to survive in an overpopulated country is because of their amazing stealth and caution, which of course also explains why most of us haven't come across them. But they are out there. with us in the top of the pop studio, Doctor and the Medics, Spirit in the Sky.